Welcome to the final episode of Series 43, everyone. We have some great discussion coming up shortly with game designer Cam Banks, designer of the Silver Any Award-winning game, Cortex Prime, which we have been covering in this series. But before we get to that, some announcements. We are about 39 days out as of the release of this episode before I close on my house and start moving into a new house. Uh, but we're also 14 days away from October's first scheduled episode, uh, and we have yet to record it. We also have a recording set for next weekend with Tracy Barnett for a spotlight episode for their upcoming game, Iron Ada Reforged which looks just fantastic. So our only chance to really record anything is literally the day before. Can we do it? I have no clue, but we appreciate you understanding if we are a tad late on next month's series as well. We are planning to cover Call of Cthulhu finally and see what that system is all about, just in time for some spooky fun around Halloween. We will keep everyone posted on our Twitter account and our Discord, so stay tuned. In other news, September is International Podcast Month. My first two games were released already last week. You can check out Employee of the Month to hear me play a 74-year-old retired super spy turned artisanal custodian who may or may not still have what it takes when the time is right. Also, the Lobsters and Feelings game that I had edited is available to listen to as well. Finally, the game I ran, Chimera, makes its IPM debut with a blend of superhero fantasy and magical girl genres, as well as a heavy dose of the musical genre. This is a fully produced episode with environmental sound design and musical direction done by myself, as well as sound effects added by Faye Onyx from the Writing Alchemy podcast. It turned out to be a phenomenal production, and I think you'll get a huge kick out of it this coming Saturday when it releases. You can go to internationalpodcastmonth.com or at PodMonth on Twitter to learn more. The pinned tweet there has links to all the different places you can find episodes, and we will put a link to that and the website in our show notes. Finally, we recently revamped our website. We are currently getting the guests added back as well as the character sheets for every series, and that process will just take some time, which we don't exactly have at the moment. But once all the hullabaloo settles down in both of our lives, we should be able to tackle that. Also, charactercreationcast.com finally goes to its own web space instead of redirecting. We would like to thank the Block Party Podcast Network for allowing us to park our old pages there for all of these years. But now we're finally looking a bit more professional, and that's pretty cool. It only took us, what, like three and a half years? It's fine. That's all to report for now. Thanks for sticking with us, everyone. We will be back after the show for some calls to action. But until then, enjoy the show. discussion episode. Last time we finished our session zero for Cortex Prime. This episode we will be discussing the character creation process. We are thrilled to welcome back Cam Banks, the designer of this very game. Do you want to introduce yourself for our audience and um, tell everybody at home a little bit about your uh, con contribution to this mess that we made? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you once again for having me here. Uh, I'm Cam Banks, um, creative director of Cortex at Fandom Tabletop. And I've been working on Cortex games for uh, quite a long time. And uh, last time we put together a very interesting little setting and my contribution to it was Todd Braveheart, 
who was raised to be the vessel for the power primordial by his parents. And they gave him all the best training they could possibly get, tried to enroll him in all the sports teams and everything else. And uh, it turns out he doesn't like any of that stuff. And he really wishes he <laughs> had cool magic like, you know, necromancy or fireballs or something really neat. Uh, it turns out mm -hmm. uh, when you're the vessel for the power primordial and you're not into it, life can be very difficult. And especially if you're at school as a teenager. Yeah, as if high school isn't hard enough. I know. <laughs> Ryan, do you want to tell everybody about your character? Yeah, so I made uh, Wilma Valentine, uh, <clears throat> a.k.a. Duo. Uh, she is uh, your your typical uh, youngest of five siblings. Uh, you know, a large family uh, can kind of get away with whatever she wants to. So she's kind of constantly pushing the boundaries. I'm thinking right? about this because I'm the oldest of five. And so as you're, as you're telling me this, I'm thinking about my youngest sibling and I'm like, yeah, they do push the boundaries. Yeah. They uh -huh. do. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, yep. it checks out. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so she's going to this perfectly mundane school and, and happens to have, uh, some uh, powers of light and darkness that she's able to draw upon to transform into duo um, her alter ego that uh, allows her to fight. Uh, we'll figure that out in the fanfic. Yeah, I don't want to say like the forces of evil because <laughs> it's not. I'm using the forces of evil to fight the greater forces of evil. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. As we're about to learn. Yeah. Uh, you know, morality is a social construct. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, so what about yourself, Amelia? Uh, I am, uh, I made Jennifer, who um, was named Jennifer by her parents, but will insist uh, to anyone that asks or doesn't ask that her name is Persephone. Mm. Um, she has uh, the power to harness your hatred and her own to create magic. Mm. Is the black sheep of her family, and um, as I said before, does believe that morality is a social construct, and uh, good and evil is what you make of it. <laughs> is it really evil if we're, you know, not doing evil things with it? Yeah, I'm. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, exactly. unclear. <laughs> Too much misunderstanding in the world of morality, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, let's go ahead and dive right into a segment that we are calling D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts? In this segment, we talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process and how it relates to playing the game um, and to other systems that we've played. But first, we like to start out with getting really generic, boring questions out of the way. <laughs> so we want to ask, how did you get into role-playing games? How did you end up designing them? I was uh, into games, role-playing games especially, starting with the very stereotypical D&D &D at the age of 10, 10 or 11. Mm. I actually kind of came in sideways through fighting fantasy game books, which anyone from the UK and the Commonwealth countries like myself was very into. Um, Steve Jackson and Ian Livingston wrote The Warlock of Fire Top Mountain and The Citadel of Chaos and all those books. Uh, they were like the choose-your-own-adventure books, but they had... Uh, kind of dice and things that you had to use to do things in them too. And that was the way into D&D &D for me. Uh, my friends at school, we all bought D&D. &D. We had a friend who came from the States and he had brought over all of his D&D &D books that we hadn't even seen yet. So that was a great thing to do when you were a young kid in 1981. Just to get that out of the way, a uh, long, long time ago. Um, but... From that point on, I mean, we were doing homebrew stuff. We were making things of our own. We all had fun putting together games because we obviously couldn't afford to get much as young teens. So a lot of the time we were drawing things into our school exercise books and making games on our own. So I think my design sort of brain kicked in fairly soon after my, my other gaming uh, brain was, you know, pr prompted by D&D. And I think we... We did some absolutely awful things when we were kids in terms of the, the terrible quality of our game sessions and being, <laughs> being jerks. But over time, I think I, I got into a real good swing of it. I think that um, all the way through high school and into college, I was running games and, and doing things with stuff that 
would later on, you know, kind of manifest as sort of principles for being a good GM and being a good designer. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people start that way um, really early with game design stuff of just like, well, we wanted this thing and it wasn't a thing, so we made it into one. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know I started playing games later. I guess I, I was 16 um, and then took kind of a break before I got back into it. And by then, for me, it felt like, um, you know, like the indie scene had really taken off and everything by that point. So it was like there wasn't a whole as much of a, a need for me to like make my own thing because there there was something out there already um but i know depending on when you started and like sort of how plugged in you were to mm-hmm. everything i know a lot of people who were just like well we wanted to do this and it wasn't a thing so we started doing it and it just kind of snowballed mm-hmm. from there i always say that like game design is that line that i won't cross because once you start you don't <laughs> you don't <laughs> stop <laughs> And I'm like, that's a bridge too far for me. <laughs> but yeah, I think I think that's the story that a lot of people have is just like we we wanted it to do something and it didn't, and so we made it. So happen. we made it do it, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Cam, what do you look for in a system as far as character creation? Like, what pieces need to be there for uh, great characters to happen? Um, I like there to be some uh, understanding at least in the character creation system of getting the people together to all agree about what the game is going to be about. I think it's, it's always good though, to have an ability to make characters independently. So you can have that, they call it lonely fun when you're Mm -hmm. making characters over and over again for a system that you know, you're never going to play because the GMs of your group (laughs) don't care about it. (laughs) But I think that there needs to be some sort of method or part of collaboration where it's actually possible to do a session zero and people can talk about their characters and sort of agree that I'm going to play this kind of character and so on. I love life path or pathways or um, any kind of sort of flow chart style character creation. Um, oh, yeah. I think that's, that's a really cool, especially when you've got maybe limited choices, but you know, those branch out to different other things. So th- those are things I look for. I'm not really as big a... Um, well, I, it's not, I'm not a fan. I just don't demand the game to have, you know, super detailed point by. Um, I don't feel that really adds as much as people think it does. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, Ryan loves a good point by system, don't you? <laughs> I, I, do. I feel like you do uh, because that's like one of the like quickest ways to min max, and you love. You are a dirty min maxer. <laughs> I am. <laughs> <laughs> you are I, uh, secretly right because like I, <laughs> secretly, as we say out loud on this podcast for <laughs> thousands of people to hear. No one will ever find out. <laughs> no, I know, right? Little secret. No, like Ryan. I, I mean, and like I don't mean that in a bad mm-hmm. way. I think that like for a lot of people, that's a really fun thing to like find mm-hmm. that little, you know, like that way that you can, you know, like I always talk about fourth edition uh, L five R. There was a way that if you if you used the point by system correctly, you could be rank two right out of character creation. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, like some people like to really mess around and do that because it's fun to find those ways to make things work Mm -hmm. um but yeah that for me is not uh mine is like how can i make all of these disjointed decisions yeah i I would be lying if i didn't think uh for a minute about min maxing uh for cortex prime characters um because it did cross my mind i was like oh there's so many options if i drop this thing down Mm -hmm. and raise this thing up but yeah i i could see the wheels turning Uh (laughs) uh-huh What's yeah. fun about it is that we, when we were doing Marvel Heroic, we actually ended up with a game that it was possible for one person to play Thor and someone else to be Ant-Man or the Wasp or Hawkeye and it not to feel as if you were overshadowed by the Thor player. Just mm-hmm. because of the way the game works, the fact that you know, you're know you making dice pools and contributing in one way or another. Mm-hmm. There's, there's obviously the, the special effect of I'm throwing a hammer and lightning is coming out of it, which seems huge and and amazing. And I'm shooting an arrow, yeah, which is somewhat less amazing, right? <laughs> right. So I don't know whether the min-max approach gives you the um, eventual endorphin rush in play that you think it does. Do you know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. you may find it, oh, I, I thought I was going to be amazing and I'm just like everyone else. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, no, there's definitely a level of, like, you know, where does that thrill happen? Mm -hmm. And um, Mm -hmm. how much 
does it pay off down the road? <laughs> right. Yeah. For um, me, it usually stops at character creation. Right. So. Obviously, like on our show, we don't have to deal with that. We just make yep. the characters <laughs> and then we never do anything with them. Um, <laughs> so we don't have to like deal with the consequences of any bad decisions that we make, mm -hmm. uh, which is really just the dream. So, <laughs> <laughs> but That's yeah, I can, I, I'm not a, a point by, because it involves math. You obviously have to keep track of the points that you use to mm -hmm. buy things. I don't like that at all. Um, I am much more of a, like, give me a choice of 10 things and then let me stress about which three I'm allowed to have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's well, really, you must have I, had tons of fun making characters then. <laughs> 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 it was great. <laughs> One of the things that we spend a lot of time talking about on this show is the interaction between mechanics and story in a game, um, and particularly how mechanics influence the kinds of stories that you can tell in a game. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, um, but you know it's why I always tell people that you can't make everything into a, a 5e hack um, and why you should play different games. But because of that interaction, even generic systems, um, settings or not or whatever, have like a predisposition to certain kind of stories. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about how you think that this one does really well with like sort of cinematic stories. How do you keep that marriage of mechanics and story in mind when you're designing a game, though? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think that's it falls under that whole um, concept of system matters, right? And I, I believe that very firmly, too. I think mm -hmm. you could play the same world with different rules, and then it feels different. Um, and that's just, I think that's just true. I don't know that there's a lot of argument for me on that score. I would say yeah. that the the question when designing it is, what am I going to implement that seems like a principle of mine as a designer that I hope will carry over when anyone puts something together with anything? And a number of things are fairly evident to people when they when they read over Cortex Prime or play a game that's primed by Cortex is the idea that the the game moderator is not the GM is not an all powerful omnipotent uh, god person who essentially lays out a story that you get to play through. Mm -hmm. um, I take a lot of power from the GM and share it among the players. I think there's a lot of that just with the way that plot points work and the way that the sort of the game is kind of predisposed for the GM to sort of frame a scene and set things up, but then has to find out what's going to happen next, just mm. like everybody else does. Yeah. And there's a lot of that because kind of hardwired into the rules and there were people who have talked to me and said, well, can I remove this part of it? How do I get it to change this? Someone asked me, can I make a completely player facing version of this game? And all those things are possible, but the more that you take things out, the less it feels like a cortex game and more like something you've just modded a bit more to your liking, which is fine. I yeah, think I mean, the that, answer is obviously yeah. cam banks cannot come into your house no. and tell you how to play a game. <laughs> I, I absolutely will not do that because uh, you don't want me in your house telling you how to do games anyway. But <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a big part of it. It's like, you know, what kind of principles can you carry, can you sort of lend it to the game? And so, yeah, um, yeah the, definitely the whole GM is not a god. Um, players have agency more than they do um, in other games or at least in traditional games. Mm -hmm. So that um, the other thing I think we'll say is that the way that the dice pool system works is because you're taking parts of your character sheet from all different areas, all the different prime sets and trait sets and things. You're kind of telling a story even just by putting your dice pool together. Like this is what I'm doing. It's going to be this and this. It's using this thing. This thing contributes to my success too. So you, there's, there's a bit of intention behind everything you do. Mm -hmm. which means yeah. that if you roll the dice all the time, it might get fatiguing. So I kind of think that people shouldn't be rolling dice for everything. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing I talk about too, is don't roll, roll unless it's meaningful. Um, in that mm -hmm. case. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, I really like that. I mean, those are things that I personally agree with in most games is that, you know, like you shouldn't roll unless there's some kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, consequence to it or, mm -hmm. or something like that. And we obviously talk a lot on this show about, um, you know, like the, the sort of player GM relationship. Um, it's just always intriguing to me how you apply all of those things in a game where you're like, well, here's a game that I made, but I don't know actually like what anybody's doing with it mm -hmm. because you can make so many, 
different things. It's just, um, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, it, it hurts my brain to think about <laughs> like how to even start designing something mm-hmm. like that. <laughs> Well, I, I'm wondering, because uh, you were talking about how you are distributing kind of the power amongst the whole group uh, instead of having the GM on top uh, and everything kind of filtering from there. Um, like, it, it reminds me a lot of like Power Bay of the Apocalypse, very narrative based, yeah. very uh, player centric. Uh, a lot of the PBTA games have the like players are able to add stuff to the story and stuff like that. And Almost every Powered by the Apocalypse game that I can think of has that very cinematic feel as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if just the act of dispersing the power amongst all the players just naturally creates that cinematic feel, uh, no matter what genre you're kind of playing. Yeah, there's the the key difference between um, Cortex and um, the PBTA games, I would say, is it's completely about the the lack of GM rolling dice of any kind, right? Um, mm-hmm. I make a big deal about how I love uh, opposed roles. I like to have this feedback back and forth between GM yeah. and player. It comes out not just in in uh, rolling ones for players and getting plot points and stuff, but when the, the GM rolls ones, the players could activate those and sort of do things to, to kind of hose the GM and, and, and eliminate their own problems. And that kind of back and forth uh, connection isn't as strong in uh, PBTA things. I think that mm-hmm. uh, it's obviously there, but the GM in a, a, if it's a PBTA game, Powered by the Apocalypse game, it is much more like a GM fiat style thing with the players getting to do stuff and the GM mm-hmm. reacts against that. And there's that whole mm-hmm. thing that Vincent calls the conversation, right? Um, yeah. But with, with, Cortex is less of that, and I think it's not. It's it's a different kind of shared power, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's shared power because we all play by the same rules, as opposed to the players take all the rules and use those, while the GM kind of shepherds things along and then reacts to it. Which is um, the the distribution redistribution is different, but I think it achieves similar results in terms of it being different feeling from a traditional game. Mm-hmm. Mm. So. Then how does the the process of uh, character creation, uh, once we have our setting and everything, how does the process of character creation reinforce the feel of Cortex Prime and set expectations for play? Hmm. You know, um, as we learned, there's there's multiple ways to get to character creation in the Cortex game. And I think some of them will make a difference too in how the game feels, the the archetype version, more like a playbook style where you take something and you, you just do a couple of changes that's really good if you don't have a lot of simple ways of getting the setting across to players other than saying, look, look, you hear the sort of nine different kinds of people that exist. Please pick one, you know, Mm -hmm. read up the background, understand how they work and just change a couple of numbers around, put a die here, a dice here, you know, the scratchable thing, which we did was really good for this ongoing collaboration of the setting as we were doing it. Like, we didn't have a setting. We were doing it as we went. Mm-hmm. And the Pathways approach is much more, let's all create a setting, but we will do it through steps and add things to a relationship map and make a sort of a make up all these locations, things on the fly. So, yeah, there's, there's ways of doing it that, that will be different. I think that what reinforces the feel is that you are creating the narrative on your character sh- character file as you go. You're coming up with distinctions. You're giving them names. You're you're labeling things. You've you've chosen certain distributions of your dice, and they all get that feel that we're we're making people come alive. We're sort of adding to the cinematic uh, sense of it. Um, mm-hmm. At least that's for me how I see it, and I think that that's been reflected back to me by people in the past telling me how they think it. It's fun to make characters because you're kind of building them as opposed to, you know, I'm just going to pick three things here and I'm good. Absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely different than, um, you know, something like D&D where it's like, okay, I'm going to pick from this pile and this pile and this, you know, and it's like now I've got like this, you know, all this stuff Mm -hmm. and I have to like shape it into a human Yeah. um, Mm -hmm. and decide like what that, what that means for this person. Um, Whereas this was very much like taking the things that I want right. to build a person. 
Yeah, and the other thing too is that it's not a zero to hero game, which I think a lot of <laughs> role playing games have always been. Start at the bottom and go to to twentieth level, you know, or whatever. Um, yeah, you make the character you want to play from the beginning, usually in Cortex. Mm-hmm. Although there's always room for advancement and growth and, and so on. Yeah, we like to look at character sheets and talk about like the intention behind the sheets and like the way that they're designed and um, you know what kind of stories they tell. When you think about like what people would want on a sheet for this game. Mm-hmm. Because I know that there are a couple example ones in the book. And yeah. then obviously we did our own thing that was separate from that. Um, what what kind of things do you think that people should focus on in a character sheet or like putting down on their sheets? Um, yep. Uh, first of all, I think it's it should be obvious where all the dice come from. Uh, and mm-hmm. so your trait sets, um, if whatever, whatever they are, skills, attributes, uh, values and things, should have their own proper place on the, the character sheet, and it should be somewhere where it's obvious you can kind of go down and check them off as you're making a dice pool. Um, mm-hmm. That kind of workflow approach to character sheet, where it's like, okay, I need this and this and this and this, and I'm good. Mm-hmm. I also like that there's um, usually places to kind of give you a hint when you're making a character, like where things are supposed to be. Like I've got it's clear the range is from D4 to D12, or it's clear that there are five spaces here for these things. Um, I always love character sheets where I can almost make the character just with the sheet, you know? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. With, a, with a bit of reference to something else, if I can go through and do the character with that sheet as a guideline. Uh, mm-hmm. That's one way that, that like playbooks, for example, in PBDA games really uh, succeed well, I think, is that it's all there. Yeah. But this is also true yeah. of other games where, they, where they've got, like, you know, hints about how things work. I think it's not true for D and D. There's no way you can make one from the uh, D and D. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> but that's no. fine. No, most of those things that have like derived attributes, it's like they're just like out of luck. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. No, I know we just covered uh, Sentinel Comics too, and that was another one that it felt um, pretty intuitive. Um, like obviously, there was a lot of stuff that we had to look up in the book and everything, but like once you had your character sheet mm-hmm. in front of you. It was very much, like, obvious to me how you use it and, like, what mm-hmm. things. is like, okay, grab one from this category and one from this category. Yep. And, you know, like, it, it felt really intentional rather than just, like, oh, okay, we should have a spot to write this down somewhere, I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 uncanny how that uh, sort of game uh, feels similar to stuff that I've worked on uh, in the past since I helped write it. <laughs> Yeah, yep. <laughs> no, I, it did come up when we were covering it, too, that it has, like, a lot of Cortex inspiration, the same thing with, mm-hmm. like, the die sizes and, and that kind of yep, stuff. Yep. But it does have that same feel of, like, you know, like I said, knowing, okay, I need to pull one of these and one of these. Mm-hmm. And, um, I think it's a thing that we've learned over the course of doing this show is exactly how important the layout of your character sheet is yeah. in your ability to build a character and then to play the character. Mm-hmm. Um, so people designing games, don't leave it for the last minute. It's actually extremely important. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I honestly, I think if I can't find what I'm looking for on a character sheet or if the sheet's like six pages long or something, there's, there's a problem, I guess, with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was reading a game recently too, that I came across like, something in the book and i was like is this the character sheet and so it's like that's an even like different issue of if i can't tell whether this is or is not the character sheet like that's also a problem Mm -hmm. um yeah yeah it makes a huge difference (laughs) Mm -hmm. so uh, one of the questions i love to ask um especially when we have designers on the show uh (laughs) is uh, what do you think is one of the biggest flaws of character creation for uh, Cortex Prime? And, and what is one of your favorite parts? A uh, big flaw would be that it's not always good for people who have who are super tired, uh, super distracted, or super worn out. Because if their brain is tired, then it's going to be hard for them to come up with uh, you know names for three distinctions or, or choose a number of things that they have to actually do some kind of creative part to it as opposed to picking off a list uh Mm -hmm. let alone having them choose their character's name which seems like it's always a huge momentous difficulty (laughs) (laughs) but i think that's that's a flaw i i i don't know that you could just sort of like half asleep stumble through character creation with cortex where um some other games i'm sure you could sort of like go to a, a session at a convention it's like one in the morning, it's the ninth one of the day you've been playing because you booked up yourself solid. 
Mm -hmm. And they just say, please fill out five, four things here. Check this box, do this. And you're like, okay. Um, (laughs) Probably not possible with with the Cortex Prime, unless we did a lot of work up front. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, especially if you throw in the the creating the system itself too. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. No, I mean, there's no way that you'll do that on (laughs) very little sleep or too much anxiety or stress at the time. I think that's probably not likely. I don't know. Mm-hmm. We could try it. We could see. <laughs> like, I have pretty chronic insomnia. So, you know, well, you maybe go. we'll get a couple days into it and we'll see how I fare. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> and I'm I'm a huge big uh, com- a proponent for making things more accessible to not just to, um, you know, uh, impaired, visual impaired or otherwise, uh, but also um, for folks who are neurodiverse or on the spectrum of some kind. I think that's really important because a lot of us. Uh, live with or are um, familiar with or have that um, sort of challenge themselves. And when you do something like what we're doing with the digital stuff, we're doing a lot more of the guided approach to help that um, out. So we're hoping that mm-hmm. makes it easier for people to, to sort of make their characters for Tales of Zadia and make their characters for whatever other game we, we come up with. Just because it's hard. It can be hard when you don't know what you're doing. If you don't have the game designer on the podcast with you helping you and so on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I will say, you know, as somebody who is neurodiverse, I find those kinds of tools to be really helpful because I, I get that sort of like analysis paralysis of like, mm-hmm. there's too many choices and my brain just shuts down. Yep. Um, and so, you know, like as fun as, you know, Cortex Prime potentially is it, without some kind of like, guardrails right. i kind of just go uh like deer in the headlights i don't know what to do mm-hmm. i'm just gonna not um and so having those kind of tools available for people makes a huge difference um because sometimes it's it's not a matter of like want to or anything like that it's just like i i can't my brain just like can't get there mm-hmm. um you know and I, I think about like um you know, just people who are tired. Like, if you're a new parent, you should still get to play role playing games. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. Um, I did a lot of my writing with my with my newborn son, who is now 19. But back in the day, when writing on Dragonlance, I did a lot of it with him on my knee at three in the morning because he just wasn't sleeping. Oh, so yes. you know, that's a thing. Right. Sure. Um, Ryan, you had asked about what the best part. I think the best part for me, at least, is just seeing someone come alive as a character in as you go through and just putting those pieces together instead of molding someone who has their mm-hmm. own almost like they have their own backstory and 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 qualities and things sort of like there ready for you to do something with and live in them in the game and that's that's my favorite thing yeah absolutely um i i really liked how they're like once we figured out what pieces we're going to be throwing at our characters to create our characters right like mm-hmm. the the relationships, the distinctions, uh, uh, the values, all that sort of stuff, right? Yeah. Um. It it wasn't that many steps to just get through it. Mm. And no, I was. And it was so much easier and quicker than I expected it to be, considering that we went in with nothing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. I was shocked. Uh, <laughs> I, I I was shocked that it wasn't a two and a half hour recording. And I've read the book before. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Like it was so yeah. much easier than I thought it would be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially since we had uh, kind of a, a a path that we were not deviating too far from. Yeah. yeah. Uh, from our initial idea, I think that helped out a lot. Definitely. I want to ask as a follow up to that that um, best part. Is there like a like a moment that you had when you were kind of putting this game together that felt like an aha sort of moment that was like this is it. We found the thing that like clicks into place and like makes this what I really want it to be. Um, I suppose when we started seeing these things laid out um, in the book, um, when Tina was doing layout and sort of doing the diagrammatical parts of it, I just thought, Oh gosh, this really is going to be something people can, can get. Um, we've got, uh, you know, really good examples. We have lots of uh, arrows and circles and things pointing everywhere. And I just mm-hmm. thought this is really cool. We had a similar feeling back when we did Smallville when I realized the pathways sort of chart with all its different pieces and all the little different examples were coming together too. Um, it just felt like we had we'd done a fairly good job of it and it was it was really manifesting as opposed to being all in our head 
as I did. Right. Like it makes sense when you still put it down on paper, not just up here. <laughs> oh, it's super mm-hmm. good when that happens because there are times yeah. <laughs> there are times it does not happen and you're like, oh. So Oh yeah. There's been plenty of times in my life too where it's like, oh, I have this really great idea, and then you write it down and you're like, What oh, I thought it was good. <laughs> but maybe it's not. <laughs> This is our favorite part of the show, I think, aside from making characters. Um, we call it our fan fiction section, mm-hmm. uh, where instead of playing the game, we just like to talk about what we think would have happened. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's let's talk about like what kind of story would we want to throw these three characters in, and and how do you think it goes? Oh, so you're asking me. Well, I, I mean, I, this is your, you, we usually kind of like talk it out. Usually, Ryan has like a really strong sense of what mm-hmm. he wants, and yeah. then the rest yeah. of us kind of just go, "Yeah." yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Ryan. Do you want to start? I, it's your magical I mean, I, girl I, dream I, world. I really love the thought of using evil to fight greater evil as uh-huh. like kind of the baseline, right? Okay. Like, like there's a really bad evil that's that's coming to. I don't know, destroy the world or, or and or universe. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. Uh, and then take all of that power for for itself. Or, I don't know, you know, magical girl anime logic, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we have control of uh, these abilities. We're the, we're the only ones of our kind that have the abilities that we have in the, in the world. And maybe we see it as like a duty. Mm-hmm. To do that, to to fight this thing, yeah. Well, we're teenagers, so obviously we think that the world like rests on our shoulders, and like right. this is, you know, we're super important. Well, I, I guess my question is: Did we become friends or uh, at least acquaintances before we started fighting evil together? Oh, oh well, yeah, yeah. That makes a big difference. Yeah. Or, or was it like we we were fighting evil as our alternate personas together, and then eventually figured out that we share a mundane connection at this high school? Um, I mean, I feel like Ryan. I feel like you and I would be like next door neighbors. Oh, yeah. Uh, growing up, and like we don't really have a whole lot in common. Mm-hmm. But we're kind of like friends. You know, it's like the friend that you you. We're the you same have age. because we're like close by, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know. And then, like, obviously, as you grow up, you you branch out and get other friends. But like, your neighbors are your first friends because they're right there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know I can when see we that working. I mean, I I feel like if Todd wants to be our neighbor too, we could be like a little neighborhood gang because those oh. are really fun. I have a feeling I had that one of those growing up. I think that Todd uh, Todd's family moved into this area, and oh. I think that Todd's family moved here because. In their sort of worldview, they're the ones fighting evil because they're the paladin family. Yeah. Oh. And they've got this kid who they think, you know, will be the next, um, you know, champion of the, of, of the power primordial and can sort of fight against all these evil things. Uh, Todd does not believe that to be the case. And Todd's a terrible child and falls in <laughs> with some bad kids at school. But those bad kids aren't really bad. They're just... Well, they're the same rebel kids who you were talking about, which is the two of you. Okay. <laughs> and so Todd's sort of rebelling against his family by by hanging out with these goth kids and otherwise, you know, just whatever. But the fun thing probably is, I think that what what's likely to happen is that uh, Persephone and Duo um, realize that they're who they are really quickly. Uh, mm-hmm. And then because Todd shows up to do something prompted by his parents, perhaps, like, it's time you go out and do this. Mm. There may be an initial <laughs> clash between the three of them. Um, oh. And before they can kind of resolve that, something worse shows up. So Todd's like, okay, so you're not the bad guys that I have to fight. That is. So mm-hmm. let's work about let's work it out. And I think that's that's a classic superhero um, meeting is when they all fight each other first, and then they go, "Oh crap, we're not, we shouldn't do this. We actually should be friends." 
Mm-hmm. And then we all go over to Todd's house for dinner and his parents actually like us because we we were fighting evil the whole time, which yeah. just makes Todd really mad because it's there's nothing worse than your parents liking your friends better than you. Absolutely. <laughs> um, <laughs> Especially if later on Todd's like, you don't realize that the two of them, their families are super, super bad. And you're like, well, but they're nice kids and you should hang out with them more. Like, What's wrong with you, mom and dad? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I also have this uh, idea that Todd is uh, an only child, and that that's the reason that he is the one that they... they if they had uh, had siblings, someone else surely would have stepped up. Right, like literally any other child. <laughs> <laughs> so, you oh, know, and I Todd. think that you two coming from big families, I mean, Todd's probably like, okay, you know, I need to have that sibling experience and has never mm-hmm. had anything like that. Um, and similarly, Todd's parents think it's great if he has friends. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you don't get to pick your friends, apparently. No. No. <laughs> no, not if you all have superpowers. No. <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> That's just destiny, and you can't help yeah. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I like how we uh, we had known each other at least before we we clashed as superheroes. Yeah. Uh, effectively, right? Yeah. Um, and the, and then the big bad. What? So so what? It, do we want to keep the big bad kind of ambiguous or? Uh, like what? What's I the like it game? vague. I like yeah. it being just like hmm, bad because yeah. I feel like we don't we don't figure out what it is until you know. It's also like not even two. darkness, season right? Two. Because that's an aspect of the the magic that Ryan's character has, right? Is light and darkness. Right. So it's something worse. So it's like you know, it's something- capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> I wow. feel like this is like the sixth episode in a row where I've suggested that the evil thing is capitalism. <laughs> but I'm well, gonna stick with it. I think that the evil <laughs> the in this US case, healthcare system. It could be the the entropy, the the, the stratification and everything else, this idea mm. that it's not corruption so much as it is eventually if this if this super big bad has its way, the world has no power in it. Because it's taken mm. away. Yeah. Mm. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of the Jeff Bezos of uh, right. <laughs> old greater old ones. Yes, yes. Once somebody has all of the money, there's none left for anybody else. Yes, Jeff, <laughs> <laughs> build a rocket ship. Yeah, God. come on, uh, Jeff, who w- certainly listens to our podcast. Yeah, right. okay, listen right. up, Jeff. <laughs> Let me tell you. Just take a sidebar to talk to uh, to our sponsor. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, let's go ahead and get into our advancement discussion and take it up a level. Mm-hmm. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. So in this segment, we talk about character advancement and growth. Um, so we like to start with how does a character level up or advance mechanically in this game? Well... It wouldn't be Cortex Prime if there weren't, like, three different ways of doing things. And so, again, right. <laughs> once again, we have three different ways of doing things. At least they're the ones that are in the book. Um, and those three ways are we have this idea of callbacks, uh, session uh, session logs, where each session we you kind of log off and say, okay, for this session, session three, uh, we did this thing, and this is what we learned and in this session four, we did this. And then you can refer back to those sessions previously to kind of do callbacks, which are fun, either flashback style or just referring to them to get, you know, benefits. So the longer you play, the more callbacks you can do and the more you have. Hmm. And you can cash those in and kind of uh, draw a line through an episode and kind of cash it in for XP. So, cool. Oh, that's really cool. It sticks around either as a thing you can refer to and, and you, you don't just... You don't personally change all that much, but you do have this kind of growing backstory, which you can always pull on. Or you can say, okay, these five sessions has been like, maybe it was last season, you know, season one, season two. Season one, I'm now cashing in entirely to make XP, and then I'll use season two for my callbacks for a while. So that's one way of doing it. And I think it might be really good for this one, because it seems like it's a pretty appropriate uh, episodic sort of game. Um, Mm -hmm. Might Mm -hmm. feel that way. Another one is milestones. Milestones are a little bit like keys in some of the games. You may be feeling like Lady Blackbird has keys where when you do a thing, you get XP for doing it. And after a while, Mm -hmm. 
you know, you can sort of close it out by doing a thing that gives you the most XP and then you make a new milestone for it. And most characters will have two milestones. The GM can come up with one for the story and say, here's a, here's a few milestones you can choose or you can pursue personal ones. And they normally give you one XP for something that's not too difficult to do, but involves you actively doing something. Three XP for something that kind of works a little bit adjacent or, or kind of against your general milestone theme. Like if your milestone is become a brave hero and you do the three thing, which is like get three XP when you could go to do something important and you choose instead not to. Mm. Okay. So it kind of, it, it makes you have that moment in the hero's journey where you kind of go, no, I'm turning away from it for a moment, you know. And then mm-hmm. there's the 10 XP, which is like, do a major, major, huge decision. Do I become the hero or do I give up this role for the rest of my life and then I get 10 XP mm-hmm. from it? So that's fun. I think that's that's good. We used that for Marvel Heroic and a few other games I think could benefit from it, but it doesn't feel very much like a thing we would use for this one. Mm-hmm. And the last one is just uh, growth pools, which is when you do things in the game that create uh, growth dice, which you save in a pool, and at the end of the session or in the story, depending on how you want to do it, you roll those dice as a pool to try and beat a number based on what thing you want to step up in your character file. Um, and we did that for Smallville. So a good example might be I'm working towards stepping up my relationship dice uh, or my specialty skill dice or something. So mm-hmm. the more... I take stress in the game or get hurt, the more that generates growth, the more I challenge the things I believe that, that makes growth dice. So you do things to yourself to sort of, you know, it's the whole school of hard knocks approach. You know, we, mm-hmm. we learn from our experiences. And so and therefore, the things that happen to me that make me, that challenge me, will become growth dice. And those growth dice I can use to roll and try and step up. So oh, very cool. Yeah. But I think I'm, I'm going to recommend probably the the session log version just because it feels like those uh um wiki entries where it's the entire season one season two episodes and you can kind of go back and oh that was the episode we did that thing remember that thing and then you do that you can get extra d8 asset for calling back to it yeah i definitely think that that sounds like what we've described too it's like Mm -hmm. you know not revealing that thing until season two like Mm -hmm. makes more Mm -hmm. sense to do it Mm -hmm. (laughs) bit by bit like that yeah, and then uh, when you when you do have that advancement, then uh, what effect does this advancement have on the the narrative? The, does the mechanical benefit represent something in the story? Yeah, um, obviously, anytime we change these die ratings, it changes their focus, it changes their narrative weight. Uh, bigger dice means more important, um, but also the the way that you tackle growth and advancement will also reflect how things work. I mean, obviously. The somewhat artificial session callback it does seem artificial because it's there's only a number of them that you've done, but it also reinforces the the story you've created together. So the narrative of the past it informs, you know, how things work out for the current game. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think the things like the milestones are a majorly narrative uh, push. It's like you're always trying to achieve a thing and get points for doing it. So it's like goal setting, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that there's different ways to do it, like based on the kind of game that you're playing. I feel like that's that is not something that I've seen in other sort of, you know, like I, I really hate the term generic, but, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> generic systems. Um, usually they still only have their one way of gaining XP or mm-hmm. advancing or whatever. Like I know Genesis, it's the same yeah. um, you know, XP point by kind of thing. Um, and I know that that doesn't, that always makes sense for stories. So yeah. I like that this has different options and mm-hmm. um, that baked in rather than waiting for, you know, your GM to say, well, we're going to do it this way instead. Because mm-hmm. um, obviously anybody can do that in any game, but mm-hmm. um, you did it for them. <laughs> yeah. I feel <laughs> The other thing too, is that I like that when XP can be spent on something other than leveling up. I think it's cool when you can unlock things. I think I talk about them in the book. Unlockables are, things in the story that, that you can kind of spend XP on to become permanent parts of the of the, the setting. And okay. maybe there are things that have mechanical ratings to them. Like maybe you've got, I can call upon my uh, cousin who is kind of tangentially related to my family, but also has different magical powers to sort of come in here for one scene and help us out. 
uh, once per session or something like that, the kind of thing. Um, yeah. Or it's like, I want to unlock a cool base that we all have. What's a cool headquarters that we have? Um, and over time, you can throw XP into that and unlock different parts of it. Mm. That's not you necessarily being leveling up. It's like you've got a shared base of, of some kind which you can add cool things to. Right. Oh, yeah. And something that like other people in the group can add things to mm -hmm. over time. Yeah, I'm a big fan of base building. I think it's one of the coolest things about role-playing games if you can do it. Um, especially oh, yeah. since you have no idea going in before the game campaign starts what it's going to look like. Um, yeah. Right. I had one game uh, that I ran of uh, Pendragon, and one of the players was super into horses and horse breeding. And there are kind of rules in Pendragon for that, it's, you know, King Arthur's Knights and things. But mm -hmm. she went crazy just into spreadsheets of how many different sires <laughs> and dams and things and... You know, what's if I breed these two animals together, what happens? Oh, this is a demon horse. Well, cool. Can I have the demon horse be part? I'm like, yep. Uh, eventually, that was the fun part of the game for her. Her night wasn't as exciting as her horse breeding fun. <laughs> Look, there's something for everybody, you mm -hmm. know, like find your fun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love that. Mm -hmm. I wish now I'm wishing more games had like base building. Mechanics. Base building, yeah. Base we're, building. We're is playing. Super fun. I'm playing Court of Blades right now, mm -hmm. um, which does have like a little bit of that in there. Um, we have defined our collection of stolen art pieces that we have in our base, um, but I, I feel like that's the first game that I've really like gotten to actually design one. Mm -hmm. Now I want that more. Yeah, I, I love that. That's an that's an, an option we can do in this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I know what we're picking. <laughs> when we don't play this game <laughs> I know right <laughs> we need a cool uh, dark hero base yeah uh, where we can be all angsty uh, out of prying eyes yeah that'll be some <laughs> bonus content we'll develop our base there you go uh, well Cam is there anything else that you want to say about uh, Cortex Prime uh, before we head out um, I don't know. I guess um, I'm really looking forward to people being able to make their own settings and uh, and and contribute to a kind of a community of design. We already have to some extent done that with what we call the Cortex Confab on our Discord, where we've opened it up so people can make their own little mods and hacks and settings and things, and we, everyone sort of playtests them. So mm -hmm. we have we we sort of post sessions and people can join them and they can playtest what someone else has made, and then we all kind of do judgments and you know uh, rate them and things that's all fun i think that eventually what will happen is we'll see even more um games that are all kind of similar forming kind of clusters around each other like a little ecosystem there'll be more games that are very much on this drama type style some will be more like action adventure style and mm -hmm. i'm looking forward to seeing you know kind of the, where that trend goes and what, what people tend to like about cortex and what they what they find themselves drawn to. Yeah. Absolutely. I always love seeing what people make with these kinds of games. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, mm -hmm. what kind of kind of stuff fan content sort of pops up from it. Um, mm -hmm. when people are given those kinds of tools where they go with it. Yeah. I'm really excited to see um where Courier's Call uh goes from here as well with Cortex with all the the different options. Uh yeah. Uh, now now that we've learned about the game, uh it's going to be really interesting going to the next episode uh, of that show and and kind of being able to kind of see what they're doing yeah. uh, behind the scenes. What from choices what, they made. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, that's going to be really fun. Yeah. All right. Well, Cam, thank you so much for uh, joining us to talk about uh, Cortex Prime. This has been wonderful. Yeah, it's been a great deal of fun. I've, I've enjoyed it immensely. I think it's always neat to... Uh, put several brains together to come up with something fun and see what comes out of it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, can you uh, remind everyone where they can find you online and any other things that you want to shout out to? Yeah. Uh, I think I would uh, tell folks to find me on Twitter at boy monster, uh, Instagram, rusty cell sword. Do check out cortex RPG on Twitter as well. Uh, there's a cortex RPG Twitter account which all the updates and things will come out from, and also cortexrpg.com for news, links, and other things to find our Discord and join the larger community of people mm -hmm. who do that. 
and and a beautiful online version of the book as well. Mm, yes. Uh, you can- yeah. Shout out to our and wonderfully searchable awesome like, dev yeah. team. Yeah, they they're great. I love them. Everyone who works at Cortex at Fandom is is a a rock star. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you again for joining us, and thank you to everyone for listening. Call to action. Yeah, like that. I was really excited to see Cortex Prime get a silver medal for best rules at the Ennies this year. It's really well-deserved and was among some truly inspiring company. It was a blast learning about this game from Cam, and he was a delight to interview. I hope you enjoyed this series as much as we enjoyed making it and leaning hard into our nonsense. Until we bid you adieu and take at least a week off, we have some quick calls to action. A reminder that September is International Podcast Month. You can find more info at internationalpodcastmonth.com or on their Twitter at PodMonth. Check out our new website, head over to charactercreationcast.com and see how it looks and let us know what you think of the improvement or if there's anything missing on there that you would like to see. Finally, we seriously thank you for all of your patience and understanding while we work to get our episodes out on time. Life is absolutely wild. Uh, We are human, and we're likely going to have a few more episodes this year to be released a little bit late. But they will be there. So patience is absolutely key. Uh, We'll get to it. But until then, stay safe, drink water, get vaccinated if you can, and keep making those amazing people. We'll see you next time. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Asians Represent. Asians Represent celebrates Asian creators and diversity in the gaming community. Join hosts Agatha Chain and Daniel Kwan as they discuss gaming, genre, and representation with their guests and occasionally argue with each other to the sound of Agatha's beloved air horn app. Yay. There we, there we go. I did it. Wonderful. Microphone in front of my face, even. There you wow, go. that's awesome. I know. Everything working over there, Cam? Seems to be.
Um, Perfect. I'm getting waves and whatnot. Oh, wonderful. All right. All right. Any questions then, uh, aside from what we've already covered before we start? Nope. I think we're good. Perfect. Okay. So I will give us a five count of silence to pick up background sound so we can filter that out in the edit. Um, And then I'll go ahead and get started. Here we go. Clicky. I waited till after I clicked it so that I could say clicky because it's it's just not the same. Clicky. But I have waveforms, so that's exciting. Big fan of waveforms. Um, Is my gain really high? I feel like my gain's really high. Does that feel better? Am I getting waveforms still? That does feel better. How does my gain get turned up when I, like, don't touch the microphone? What is that about? There's gain ghosts out there somewhere. Just messing with people's gain. I'm so sorry, Ryan. That was really messy. But please make it into something usable. Eleanor got to pet a chinchilla at her summer camp and was, like, losing her mind because they're so soft. Yeah. She's like, we should get one. I was like, I'm not getting a chinchilla. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not. Not cheap either. Mm-hmm. No, no, we already have a dog. Like, it's not like she has no pets. Mm-hmm. She also made um, a favorite llama friend at summer camp. And of course, that llama's name was Trouble. Mm-hmm. That's the llama she picked. Yeah, of course. <laughs> All right. Yay, we can stop. All right, let's stop our recording. Stop recording. Yeah. All right. All right. I have weird air conditioning waveforms again. Just so oh you know. yeah, those are fine. Okay, they just I'm not look... turning my air off because that one time I did and I was so crabby about it. So uh-huh. I'm not doing it for you. Okay? <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> they look angrier than they really are. So okay. just like me. <laughs> <laughs> How apt. Um. Oh, I left my glasses somewhere. I assume you need oh. glasses to to read. Yeah, I got them. Oh, gross. The dog was eating them too. Oh no! <sighs> that Dan would problem. tell me if he knew like all of the the crap that I put my glasses through. He doesn't even like that I put them on top of my head. Mm. His, my ex husband is an optician, and so he's always like, "You have to take care of your glasses, and you can't like take." And I'm like, <laughs> "Whatever." What? <laughs> um, <laughs> You've got but, like, like a, a dog who's just like chewing on them. I'm, like he would have a heart attack if he saw this happening right now. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> uh, All right, so we can go ahead and stop our recordings. We did it.